Welcome back to Deprogrammed. This is the new Culture Forum show committed to fighting back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name is Harrison Pitt. I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm delighted to be joined again today by Connor Tomlinson, the host of Tomlinson Talks at thelotuseaters.com, and our special guest this week, Charlie Downs, content lead at the Center for Migration Control and a young up-and-coming political commentator and good friend of both Connor and mine. So listen, thank you, Charlie, for coming on. My pleasure. Uh, today. Um, th we're going to talk about this a lot. There's a rising uh, movement of, I think, Anglo-Zoomers. Mm. I think that might even be your, your Twitter handle. Certainly. Is. Your Twitter bio. Um, uh, who on everything from housing to the state of Britain as a nation itself feel fundamentally cheated out of an inheritance. And one thing that's been encouraging lately is that these people have begun to organize in a much more effective political fashion. There's a there's an open letter at the moment, uh, doing the rounds on Twitter, garnering a lot of signatures, uh, people angling to try and set up a Reform UK youth wing, and uh, you've been fairly involved in that along with some other enterprising, intelligent young Zoomers. W what is it about, and um, what, do you, what are you fundamentally trying to achieve? Mm. Well, if I may, I'd like to sort of begin with kind of where we are, right, as a country, as a generation. Um, the Zoomers are coming of age. We are waking up to the kind of wider world that we live in. We are uh, kind of coming to understand um, the world we've grown up in, um, and we're coming to realize that we have been cheated, as you said. Mm. We have had something taken from us that our parents, our grandparents, um, and so forth um, had that we don't have. Um, we've only ever known our country as this kind of multicultural economic zone. We've only, only ever known it as this platform upon which economics happens. It's not really, it doesn't really have a culture. Um, we've been told that British culture is not something that really exists. Um, I remember when I was going through school through the Blairite educational program that I was kind of taught that British culture is almost like the default culture. And the, of the world. Ex exactly. Yeah. Which, in a way, it is. I mean, English is the, obviously, obviously is, the, is the language of the first world. Um, and, you know, Britain is responsible for the modern world as it exists, for better or worse. Um, however, we were taught that culture is to be understood as kind of uh, something foreign, something exotic, uh, something kind of um, almost... I don't want to say savage, but, but, it's, but it's kind of that Rousseauian looking at the noble savage type thing. That's what culture Glamorizing is. Glamorizing the other. Exactly. Whereas our culture is the highest that the world has ever seen, in my opinion. And we were not taught that. Um, we were taught British culture as being uh, fundamentally a thing of, uh, composed of values, first and foremost. Yes. Um, I remember where I went to university in, uh, in the town, there was a mural celebrating Magna Carta's 800 year anniversary. And the values that Magna Carta supposedly represented was equality, mm -hmm. democracy, uh, peace, diversity. Just, you know, the, the, the stock standard duck speak talking points. Of the, the feudal the power barons structure. that, that authored it were really concerned about in, in franchising 16 year olds, I'm sure. <laughs> Very much so, yes, indeed. Um, but that's the kind of, uh, that's the, the, um, the way in which our culture has been taught and to our generation. And repackaged. Yes. Indeed. Um, and so, you know, I think the nature of human beings is. However much we, we like to imagine that we are all these kind of self-aware, self-actualized, um, entirely rational beings, um, the truth of the matter is we are herd animals. And so when the shepherd, if you want, tells us where to go, we follow him. When authority tells us what's true, we en masse believe, believe the authority. And so when you know, we were growing up, when we were going through the educational system, and we were taught that this is what our culture is, most of us have gone through life believing that. And many of us have not even realized what's been taken from us. However, there is an emerging uh, network of young people, people our kind of age, who are realizing. Yes. And we are very, very angry. Because yes. we, we look back at what's been taken up from us. We look back at, you know, even archival footage of Britain, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago. We hear the stories from our parents and grandparents. And it sounds like, a, it looks like, and it sounds like a fairy tale land, you know, compared to what we have today. Um, and so Reform Youth, I believe, is the kind of latest and most ambitious um, expression of this feeling. Because at last we have a, a, an opportunity to actually get a foothold in the halls of power. And I'm talking about Nigel Farage here, of course, with Reform. Yes. Um, reform, I've had a mixed opinions on Reform over the last couple of years, because I think they've made some grave mistakes. Uh, I think caving to hope, not hate has been uh, shameful. Um, and I think that uh, the flavor of the party has been out of touch with the young. 
But since the re-entry of Nigel Farage to the party, I think that there has been an energy around him and around the party that I haven't seen for the entire time that I've been politically aware. Um, and I think that a lot of people are very excited uh, about what's happening. Um, and as I say, we see it as an opportunity to actually achieve something, to actually do something. Because many people have said to me, oh, well, you know, why are you supporting Reform UK? You've been critical of them in the past and blah, 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 blah. And to those people, I say, well, look, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good because we have an opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity here to actually, you know, it's the, Farage is the thin end of the wedge that gets us into the halls of power and we can then actually start, you know, making a difference if you want. Um, I, I, I think what's happening is we have people from the older generation who have become more sympathetic to that plight. A perfect example of this, as we, a friend of the show, Matt Goodwin, he's now employed some anonymous Zuma yep. to write <clears throat> multiple pieces for his Substack, which are testimonials of how it is to live as a young 20 something man, mm. renting for extortionate prices, which confiscate all of your savings to live in the only city, which has become the centralized mm. economic opportunity hub in all of Britain. And then above and below you, you have migrants on social housing who create a hostile environment for the women in the area, yeah. who stink up the place with drugs, who you know are subsisting off of your tax money, and the kind of resentment that builds mm. because you're doing the right thing, you want a family, you want to settle down, you want a sense of civilizational belonging, you actually want to take on duties and responsibilities to the worthy dependents and even a nation with a rich and proud history, and you've been deprived of all of that. And now we're getting people like Farage, thankfully, who said when he announced that he was running, something is happening out there. There are lots mm. of young people. You're seeing various parties in the EU elections. I'm thinking Jordan Badala, who yep. used to potentially run an anonymous account on Twitter, though he has denied that, but that would be hilarious would if that's true. Uh, at least he was he used to stream Modern Warfare 2, so that means he's very resilient Incredible. against the kind of insults yes. that were that were slung around in there. There's a sort of youthful exuberance that has been in the air for a while, that kind of resentment. It's been mm. a, a palpable electricity. Now it's formed into a cloud and it's striking the lightning rod mm. of things like the AFD in Germany mm. and it seems to be reform over in the UK. And yes. I was very encouraged that lots of provisions in the manifesto seem to be leaning towards the kinds of house building, the kinds of national belonging, the kinds of family creation policies that I and, and you lads probably want to see too. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the older generations waking up to our plight, if you want, is, is right. But I think that something, something that people don't quite grasp is that for, for example, our parents' generation, they lived most of, most of their life, if they were living in this country, um, in old Britain, if you want. And they don't understand that all we've ever known is this Britain, is new Britain. We've never, we never knew old Britain. I was born in 2001. You know, that, that's, that's four years after, you know, you can, you can argue when the, when the problem began, but I mean, 1997 is quite a good um, kind of Time point, post. I would yes. say. Yes. Um, so, you know, we, we never knew, we were long, you know, old Britain was long gone by the time we were born um, or by the time I was born. But I think, kind of helping the older generations to understand, like, look, we want what you had, and we've never known it, but we want what you had desperately, because we don't want this kind of, you know, we don't want to be an atomized person in this just economic zone where we're all interchangeable, and we're all anywhere people, and we're all just kind of, you know, fungible cycling along, units. fungible consumer units. No, we want the deep, thick experience of human life. We want to be part of a community, because, you know, I... I to, this might seem like a strange uh, person to bring in, but Jordan Peterson had a very uh, significant impact on my thinking. He was one of the first kind of um, people that really, really caused me to realize what's happened to our country. Um, <clears throat> but he talks a lot about individualism. And I think that focusing on individualism is wrong because I'm not saying I'm a collectivist, but the collective is very important. The collective is in many ways more important than the individual. Well, because... I mean, sorry, sorry no, 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 no. You're, no, you're about to say something, so I didn't... Well, because, you know, without the collective, the individual has no identity. And identity is very, very important, because this is another thing I'd like to say. For as much as the older generations rag on the left, quote-unquote, about identity politics, identity is inescapable. Identity, in fact, I would make the case, is divine and necessary for human flourishing. And so to reject identity politics in the name of values, I think fundamentally misunderstands the problem. I mean, like you said, in my Twitter bio, I describe myself as an anglo zoomer which is identity. That's identity no, politics. No, neither of those things did you choose. Yes, indeed. Um, but that is how I, you know, I, I believe that those things, me being an Anglo, an Englishman, a Brit, mm. and being a Zoomer, 
Gen Z in my early 20s, mm. they fundamentally inform my experience, my lived experience, mm. if you want. Because this is the thing. I really believe that it's important to give the devil its due. I think that the left actually get a lot of things right, but their conclusions are just bonkers and, and incorrect. Intersectionality, for example, making the claim that different people have different experiences based on their different identities, that is actually true, right? And getting to grips with that, coming to terms with that, I believe is very important because the conclusions that they draw based on that fact are insane and ridiculous. However, it, is, it, remain, it remains true. You know, because just because the conclusions are, are mad doesn't mean the analysis is incorrect. So Harrison, sorry, what were oh, you No, no, say? no, I was going to say that um, I agree with you. I think that identity is, is, a, is a vital feature of both individual and collective human psychology. It is inescapable in the way that you describe. The question is, how we un to understand that identity. And I do think that liberals would, classical liberals, mm. uh, their anthropology would make room for an account of human identity which they would regard as properly thick. For them, its thickness would consist in the fact that it, it is created by the individual. In other words, nothing is make, staking a claim on the individual from outside. Our identities aren't inherited, the, the classical liberal would want to say. They're, they're, they're fashion. Now, I think that's a very implausible anthropology. I don't, yes. I, don't, I don't go along with that at all. But you're right to say that identity is vital. And, and, and for people who are concerned that this necessarily means, you know, instantly means sort of Black Lives Matter and Palestinian pro-Palestine marches mm -hmm. through the streets of London. Identity politics doesn't necessarily mean that there are two versions of identity politics. There is that kind of grievance mongering mm -hmm. identity politics with which we're very well accustomed and which is a, a complete um, calumny against this nation, which has been welcoming, right? I would argue far too welcoming of that, of, of that kind of mentality. But there is also the kind of um, identity politics, which understands not so much that politics should be about identity, mm. but that identity is always in some way going to pre precede politics. Yes. And in, in, order, in order for us to have political conversations, there needs to be a powerful sense of collective identity, binding people together. So yes. the, like what Aristotle would have called a sort of fundamental friendship as the basis of the polis, mm. a kind of sh shared experience of shared ancestry, shared heritage, all this, mm. that sort of thing, which feeds into a cooperative conversation about mm. what are we going to do politically. And that is only possible in very homogeneous parts of the world. In diverse parts of the world, politics becomes about identity. Yes. In homogeneous parts of the world, po identity precedes politics and it's, and it's much healthier. And we're seeing that in Britain literally today. I saw, I saw an image today. I don't know where it was from, but it was from a, uh, a small crowd mm. of uh, phobe wearing Muslims wearing vote la uh, holding vote labor yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's you look at that and you just think well they're not <laughs> they're not in that because they believe in the vision of Keir Starmer no, no, no they've not read the manifesto no it's political clientelism yes plain and simple. yes yeah. absolutely this is exactly why Angela Rayner did a struggle session with a bunch of men who couldn't look uh, in the eye of the yeah. diverse Middle Eastern extraction saying that as soon on day one our main priority for the, the party the British working class is to recognize the state of Palestine and call mm. for a ceasefire and it's like yeah, yes Thank you, yeah. Minister for the Gaza Strip. Yes, but, it, it, yeah. but it's also a, a concession, a massive concession to us, um, implicitly, what she was doing there, because what she is implicitly saying when she, when, when she addresses those men, and they were men, as a kind of uh, c collective with collective grievances, mm. she is both conceding that uh, sectarianism has a very distorting effect on politics. Yes. She's having to do a clean-up job mm. for her own party. That's clearly proof that diversity is not a strength in that constituency, at least. But she's also implicitly acknowledging that these people are not the, these undifferentiated mm. consumer units. Mm. She wasn't addressing them individually as individuals in that room. She was speaking to them as a collective. Yes. And so that, 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 that was excellent propaganda. And, this is, and this is <laughs> crucial because actually, when I talk about giving the devil its due, yes. let's look at the uh, quote-unquote Muslim community in Britain. They think of themselves as a group. They think of themselves as belonging to a people, as representatives, as leaders it's of their the, group, as, called, a, as, as a vanguard. It's called the Ummah. They, call it, they have yeah. a word for it. It's the Ummah. And that, yeah. for, a, for however much that's causing problems for the native British, I believe that we should look at that and follow their example, frankly. Because I think that they are think, the way they are thinking, is far, historically speaking, is far more normal. Yes. Because the way the British think is very, very strange. We think we don't think of ourselves as belonging to a people. We don't think of ourselves as representatives of our nation. We think of ourselves as individuals. It's a very Western idea. It's a very European idea. Um, but that's coming back to, you know, it's, it's backfiring massively because it means that those people who do think of themselves as belonging to a group, who do think of themselves as being representatives of their group and as uh, advancing the interests of their group, beat us every single time. Well, this is because what Renaud Camus warned about. It's essentially the unilateral conception of European and mm. English countries as 
free-floating atoms who are liberal and pluralistic and tolerant and individualistic mm -hmm. will lead them to think that every other nation in the world thinks of themselves in the exact yep. same way. Mm -hmm. They will then import that. And that, that idea has taken on an aspect since the Second World War because the Germans did nationalism twice. Mm -hmm atrocities ensued and now no one else can do it again. Yeah. <laughs> the issue is not everyone else is as wedded to that post-war narrative, mm. which obviously nobody wants to see a second Holocaust. Yeah. And so they import people that actually would quite like to see a second Holocaust, Indeed. hence the Palestinian marches. Yeah. The, the one thing I will, I will pick up on, on on the reform front about this is, of course, the sectarian politics that Nigel Farage has rightly pointed out has an ethnic and religious aspect. Mm -hmm. Reform's manifesto definitely didn't have that. It had a reactionary combat against the likes of Sharia law and the grooming gangs, all of which yeah. are excellent. But I, other than the patriotic education system that they proposed for primary and secondary schools, which said that Britain had a role in combating the slave trade, I think one thing that needs to be taken further on that grounds is that it needs to have a positive identity projected outwards. It's not just that Britain is a prosperous economic zone. It's not mm. just we ended slavery. It's not yes. just we protect women and gays better. There is no mention of Christianity mm. in that manifesto. Mm. Yeah, there wasn't the UKIP one yeah. in 2015, for example, about religious freedoms and, and the persecution of Christianity in public life. <coughs> Even though we have an established church, there was, there was no representation of that. And it didn't feel like there was a strong enough sort of English identity projection. Yeah. We need something for people to buy into. So I think that's an iteration that reform should, should do to- Yeah, to you've, you've raised something interesting there actually about the, we protect women and gays best. That's the grounds upon which uh, Islam is always attacked by most people in Britain. That it's, it's essentially think of the gays and the women, which is true. It's, it's, it's fair to make that argument. However, I don't believe that that's the right grounds upon which to attack Islam. Because for whatever, again, for whatever you want to say about Islam, it does, you know, the people who follow it, I mean, you, you look at the, the Green Party candidate who was elected, for example, who was screaming Allahu Akbar. That kind of passion, that kind of fanaticism, I think is actually quite admirable. As, as much as I disagree with the cause, I want to see our people expressing that level of, of rage and, and power, you know, but we don't. Because Islam, you know, again, for, what, for whatever you want to say about it, it has its fanatics, it, ha it has its radicals, it has its extremists, and they express themselves in, in the most ghastly and awful and evil ways. Um, but what you can't say is that they are docile. Um, they are very, very active. They are very, very aggressive. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not by, to be clear, I'm not saying that I want our people to be engaging in terrorism or anything of the sort, but what I do want to see is a level of fire in, in our people that we don't currently have. And we can look at the Muslims and we can look at the passion that their faith inspires and think, actually, that's quite desirable. It's a double-edged sword though, isn't it? I mean, mm. I, so I, 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 I agree with that in spirit, but one concern, I mean, I, I would imagine, for example, that there mm. are many uh, Muslims who think in this country mm. who are, um, are law abiding and all that sort of thing. Mm. So I get, not, not hashtag, not all Muslims. Mm. Okay. But of course, uh, but yeah, whatever, course. um, just to get it out of the way. Mm. Uh, but, um, I think, I wonder whether there are some people who share the mentality of those extremists who often feel as though those extremists are letting the side down more mm -hmm. broadly yeah. by making the problem with, um, Muslim immigration into Britain much more uh, potent and much more salient in the in the public mind. Yes, I wonder whether I I, I, can't, I can't think of a good example as such. But I say let's say someone. I mean, I, I, for, I for example view both Sadiq Khan and Hamza Yusuf as you know vindictive colonizers, frankly, and they make that mm. quite plain in their rhetoric. I yeah. mean, Hamza Yusuf railing against the majority white population in Scotland, mm. Sadiq Khan plastering the porn, uh, plastering the tube with anti-white revenge porn, all yes. that sort of thing. You know, the, 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 these, these people are declaring their purpose, Yes, but they do it in a, a slightly more subtle way than that Green Party candidate chap. Mm. And I think um, sort of polite English middle-class sensibilities are much, much more um, enraged by that sort of thing and, uh, yeah. uh, than they are by the Sadiq Khan and the comes use of stuff. Lament that though I do, because mm. I think they should be paying far more attention to those sorts of people. And I wonder if we were to lean too much, mm. obviously we don't want to be docile, mm. but if we were to lean too much into that kind of fieriness and rage, mm. whether there would not be a similar um, mm. effect on, on sort of polite so, middle-class England. I to, think you're quite right. Yeah, okay, to, to build off of that actually, mm. if it, on, on Zoom a message discipline, because mm. I do think that's yes. something that we actually, we need to have. There is no shortage of passion, but yes. there is certainly a shortage of direction. Most definitely. It's, it's kind of the opposite of the, again, hashtag not all, but boomer, <laughs> messaging that kind of wants to keep the status quo because it's all that they've ever known. Yes. And sometimes I don't sympathize with why we want to upend it. I actually prefer the framing of looking less 
at the uh, mini caliphate that's currently growing mm. in in <laughs> in UK politics, and instead looking at what you were saying in your NCF event speech, Harrison, oh. which is that, I mean, I'm not Jewish and I've never set foot in Israel. Mm. I just want for Britain what Israel has, which is yeah. a, a strong religious identity, a, yeah. a strong national and ethnic identity, yes. positive birth rates, positive GDP per capita, and people willing to enlist and defend it when it is attacked. Yeah. And so actually, and, and I think that's actually probably a more palatable framing mm. for some of those middle class, perhaps older people yes. um, who are concerned about respectability mm. in yes. politics, not, not, for, not for an unfair reason. I couldn't agree more. And there's, a, there's another point to be raised here as well, which you know I've made to you chaps before, which is even if it could be shown that bringing these people to this country was economically beneficial, even if these people did share our quote unquote values, even if they were Christian, for example, that still wouldn't make what has happened to this country over the last 25 or so years with mass immigration right. It would still be an enormous crime against this country because the fundamental fact of the matter is these people are not of this land. And regardless of however much you know, you can imbibe the values, quote unquote. I mean, values are a strange one because you've made the point before that an Englishman of 500 years ago doesn't share our, quote unquote, our values. But does that make him any less English? Obviously not, right? Yes. Um, and so I think- The, the example I used to, to, to really hammer at home it, mm. always is this. There, it is plausible that there are Nigerians living in Lagos today, mm. which is slightly more progressive part of Nigeria than, than, than the, the rural uh, hinterlands, mm. uh, who believe in, say, gay marriage. Mm. It's possible. I mean, I'm sure there will be some uh, they believe in democracy, believe yeah. in tolerance, um, uh, and that those are the precisely the sort of values that that a that a midwit like David Cameron will will wheel out. Mm. As, I was about to say, uh, this is the African yeah. branch, the David <laughs> Cameron yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So here are here are the ten bullet points that make you British, and one of them mm. is tolerance, one of them is gay marriage, and just generally being a nice chap. Yeah. And so if that that those if those are our values, it's mm. possible that a Nigerian buys into those in a way that someone like Lord Bolingbroke from the 18th century does not. Yes. And so, but, so not only that would it make Lord Bolingbroke not mm. English, it would make the Nigerian more English than Lord Bolingbroke yes. if that version of, if that uh, spin on civic nationalism yeah. is true. Which is absurd. Yes. Because, because again, we, we're, we're back <laughs> at identity. And identity is, you know, the left or right when they say it's, it is actually very, it's quite difficult to define mm. what native British means. Because it's, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of nexus of a few different things. Because there is a certain amount of it that is values. But then there are, but it, it's not just values. Yes. There are other things. There's heritage. There's ancestry. And this it's sort of feeling thing. inextricably at home here. Yes. This is why when David Starkey said in the coronation coverage on GB News and got in trouble that we don't have a prime minister which is brought up into our, our culture and our identity. Mm. And he said some of this is religious. It's also the fact that Rishi Sunak could be at home anywhere else where the job prospects are better going. Mm. And say anything you like about Nigel Farage, again, I've, I've quibbled with his pandemic policy, for mm. example. He is definitely an English politician. Oh, yeah. That's why he served as a lightning rod for yeah. young lads like us who are concerned with questions of identity. Yeah, yeah. And again, he is the only, he's the only politician who is speaking in the terms that we like to hear. I mean, again, you know, we're, we're agitating for, for more, which is the purpose of Reform Youth. But at just, least just, it's, it's a good start. Just, just elaborate on that precisely, because I think people will be curious to know, just on, on a more nuts and bolts level, mm. uh, fascinating though this has been, what, what Reform Youth is actually trying to achieve. Why, do we, why, does, why does there need to be a youth wing? What, what kind of pressure are mm. they trying to put, polite and friendly pressure, are they trying mm. to put on Farage in, in formulating, I think, five key points? Yeah. Just to elaborate so on that for a bit. Farage has talked a very good game about young people, and he's right to say that young people are big fans of his, because his, his social media game is phenomenal, yes. you know? Um, and, and I know... And we saw it in Clacton recently, we, we, we were both there. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's tremendous. And I know personally people in my own life who are not into politics under normal circumstances, young people, yes. who are saying, yeah, I like that Farage bloke, he's yes. a good guy, yes. like him, funny, yes. you know, he's, he's like a cool guy. Um, and that's ultimately, that's ultimately Farage's utility, and that's ultimately what I want Reform Youth to ultimately be, yes. is making uh, the kind of talking points, that, the kind of issues we've been talking about on this podcast cool. Mm. Because for a long time, the left have, uh, have kind of uh, positioned themselves as being the countercultural, as being the edgy, the cool ones. But actually, we live in a time now where if you are left-wing, if you are kind of egalitarian and quote unquote woke, as much as I despise that word, you're not a radical. Because if your opinions line up with every government, every university, every major corporation, every media company, every NGO, and, and so on, and the then you're, and, you're and, not a radical, you're a foot soldier of the regime. And you don't even realize it. That's the, yeah. that's the, the greatest trick 
the system, the power structure that we live beneath has ever played is convincing those people who think of themselves as radicals mm -hmm. to be its loyal foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. I think like that's the brilliant. devil that, uh, that doesn't even exist in and of itself. It's yes. The liberal mi milieu is the default. Yes, yes indeed. Yes. But I, I think that's brilliant. And I think that's genius. It, deeply evil. Yeah. <laughs> so so, the, so the, four, the four pledges, as, as we understand, because mm. we're, we're friends with the enterprising chaps who've started it, mm. is uh, freeze on migration and increased house building. I know that yep. raised some eyebrows, but the, the stipulation is not the human battery farms we see knocked up everywhere, yes. not, the, not the endless Barrett new builds, but it's like family purposed yes. homes. And um, ones that look like they belong in the landscape in which they're being built. Because another point I'd like to make is where I live in Kent, um, this is a, a really... It's an anecdote, but I think a lot of people will be able to relate to this experience. There's a field near where I live, uh, or rather there was a field near where I live, that I used to play in when I was young, where I used to walk my dog when I was a kid. And that field doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. because it has been paved over uh, for a Barrett new build estate. And the houses look horrible. They, they look like they've come out of an Ikea flat pack. Um, and moreover, I will never have any prospect of living in them because they're so astronomically expensive. And so one wonders, well, who will be living in them? And, well, we all know the answer. They'll be subsidised at our expense, Indeed. yes. People from the fictional nation of Bomalia, I, yes. I'm sure, yes. Indeed. Yes, so it's, it's to set up the Reform Youth Wing, uh, <laughs> migration freeze, because I have noticed that they've dropped the net zero migration hmm. term that's ever right. since people that's turned around and said, hang on, you mean that's 500,000 native British out hmm. and 500,000 Afghans in? That's, hmm. not, that's not stopping the, the immigration problem. Yeah. Uh, it was the defunding and the withdrawing of charity status from any NGO mm -hmm. or hostile body like Hope Not Hate who seek to censor speech and discourse on university campuses yeah. and, and in broader society, and the deregulation of things like alcohol bans, smoking bans. Yes. To, because Just deregulation of our lives yes. in general. Yeah. If, we, if we've been locked away for a couple of years and had absolutely no social life, you, know, mm. you, need, to, you need to get it off the ground a little bit. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that a, a youth movement is absolutely essential in this country because we don't have one. I mean, I, when I was at university, I went to the, uh, the Tory society a couple of times. That was a and, mistake. Yeah. As I'm sure you boys will agree. <laughs> as I a straight was, man, that was definitely a mistake. Yeah. For I, all of us. I was disgusted <laughs> at, at the people, the kinds of people that that had attracted because it was half LARPers who thought, you know, who were acting like what they thought Tories should act like. Yeah. That being snobby. Um, I don't know what your rules on uh, swearing are on this podcast. Go ahead. Snobby um, individuals, let's just say. I'll keep it, <laughs> keep it civil. Um, <clears throat> who just, who acted like they were better than everybody, yeah, who, yeah. who belittled people for what they were wearing and this sort of thing. Um, and the other half were just straightforward degenerates who were just taking drugs all the time, having casual sex all the time with each other, with, with others and, you know, all the rest of it. And I mean, obviously that's the Tory party in general, but, um, you know, I, I look such at cases. that. Indeed. I look at that and I think, is that really the best that the right-wing youth have to offer? And obviously it isn't because we know, we, the three of us know people who are very, very intelligent, very motivated, very driven, very stylish, very cool, um, interesting, aspiring, who feel they have no representation. We have no organization that, that actually brings us together. Because I think that what's crucial at this moment is getting those people in a room together, getting them working together, getting them talking to each other, having them become friends, both personally and politically, and trying to build something positive. And I think that Nigel and Reform UK can be the kind of conduit through which that can happen, um, which is why I believe Reform Youth is essential, because it's not just going to be a social club. It's not just going to be, oh, we meet up and we hang out and we go out for drinks, because that's what, I mean, Tory, the young conservatives and young Labour are, that's pretty much what it is. You know, there's a certain amount of uh, feeding through into the party proper that happens. But what I want to see Reform Youth be is a, a an organisation that has very high standards, expects a lot of its members, and tries to foster an environment of excellence, you know, of greatness. The, the, the sense that you are the bearers of civilization, the people involved in this group. You will be the next generation of leaders and of, 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 uh, of inspiring figures. Because there's so many people out there right now who have those kinds of, who I can see in the future being those kinds of people, but they are out there on their own. You know, they're making excellent content or they're doing excellent things, but they're out there on their own. If we can get these people together, get them working together, then I think that's just dynamite. Well, listen, Charlie, it's been um, enlightening. We expected that, but also a much needed energy boost. Thank you so much for joining us. My on, pleasure. On, Thanks on, for having me. On Deprogrammed, and uh, hopefully lots of signatures will arise from this, uh, yep. from this podcast. Reformyouth.uk. Brilliant. And um, Connor, thanks as ever. Thank you. You've been watching Deprogrammed. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish to do so, and we shall see you on the next one. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, 
May I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.